Day 321 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Jelzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. And as always, we'll start off with those Russian military losses, so as of the 10th of January. So Russia is currently sitting on 112,470 military personnel losses there. Now, uh, that represents an addition of 710 in the past 24 hours. Then we'll take a quick peek at the hardware losses, so armoured combat vehicles, an additional 7, tanks 4, and artillery 4 as well. Then we'll move back to the map, and we'll start out in the Donbass region today. Certainly a lot happening here. So in the Russian-occupied Kremina area, so zoom in right there, here we go, hiding behind those two oinky pigs, uh, Russian oinky pigs. Uh, a Russian ammo dump is reportedly on fire. Now, this footage is from the uh, Ukrainian soldiers in what appears to be some pretty close quarters to the occupied town. Then moving south to really where a lot of the uh, actions are occurring at today, so Solodar, where the battle rages as both sides are conducting operations really here at the moment. And I'll just find that and zoom in there. So here we go. In fact, General Sersky, who is the commander of the ground forces of Ukraine, has visited troops in the area of Bakhmut and Solodar as well. Though there was some reports today of Ukrainian uh, retreats due to the risk of encirclement. Although operational silence is observed, so no further comment has yet been made. But effectively, right now, the Russian forces have been making some gains to the south and the east of Solodar. Also, the Ukrainian general staff just previously reported that uh, Russian fire control, so for artillery fire control, has uh, occurred over parts of the supply route to Solodar, so on the Ukrainian side. And I can see the AFU is fighting backwards, effectively, and they may themselves choose to have to concede the region and set up new fortifications just to the west of Solodar, for instance. But we also know that uh, the Ukrainian forces are adding reinforcements to Solodar very recently. But let's just say there is a withdrawal from the Ukrainian side. This would mean that Ukraine is not looking to have any unnecessary loss of life and instead set a new staging ground for defences for a, a later counter-offensive. But they are still holding. I'm not trying to be grim here, just trying to give it as accurate an assessment as I can right now. And there's more and more footage of some recent uh, well, close quarters combat. Firearm shot sounds are, are popping off in the background with the audio feed on this one. Of a place that really looks like a, a worn, torn Mariupol. Reportedly, there is actually not much left of the town to fight for. So it was quite a powerful assault by the Russian forces as they tested Ukrainians' defensive lines. But the Russian uh, assaults came after some earlier failures in the past two days from the Russian forces, which caused them to have to regroup then change tactics. For the new assault, which reportedly had the Russian forces literally stepping over the bodies of their fallen comrades as they made more advances. So it's still not a certainty or a foregone conclusion of the the Russian occupation uh, taking Solidar, but uh, the countless cannon fodder they are throwing into the meat grinder, if you will, suggests there is certainly something of a chance that they may take this location, but only time will tell. And again, Ukrainian forces do continue to say in the last a minute before I've started this recording that they are actually still holding. Then we'll move down to a similar situation, not as bad though, so Bakhmut, certainly quite a, an aggressive situation here still for both sides, uh, but Bakhmut by contrast has always been particularly well fortified from Russian assaults. But make no mistake, Russian forces are said to be assaulting in mass from all directions of the town right now but the main assault attempts of which have been from the south and the, the northeast. And that's with nearly around the clock assaults from Russia now, with additional frontline infantry forces, swaths of them. 
But really, the moral of the story here around Solodar and Bakhmut is that Russian forces have recently brought large amounts of mobilized units who are being thrown into battle in these areas. And the thing is, these units are very combat ineffective and inexperienced and continue to attack fortified positions in waves. The, the loss of life for the, the Russian forces, or the Russian side, is tremendous. And this is potentially all so that the head Wagner PMC knob, Prigozhin, can get his hands on those salt mines and gypsum mines, which will never have any value or output due to being destroyed from a little friend of ours. Then next up, somewhere in the east or in multiple locations in the east, in fact this happened yesterday, but the AFU shot down three Russian helicopters. That's why it didn't show on today's results, although if we go back in time, it's quite a big day that I wasn't here to report on, but you can see 11 tanks, 17 ACVs, and three choppers. So these are the ones I'm talking about now. So there was two Russian KA-52 attack helicopters and an additional MI-8 Russian helicopter there. So the, the KA-52 choppers, also known as alligators, they're about 15 million US dollars a piece. And the MI-8s are, well, the export version goes for about 5 million US dollars a piece. But that's technically not even the real issue for Russia here. Their even bigger issue is that Russia now has an extremely restricted capability to replace them in the field. Because any new Russian aircraft production relies on the global supply chains involved to import the parts necessary to create them. And Russia is now the most econom economically sanctioned country in the world, more so than North Korea or Iran by a long shot, double the amount of sanctions. Then moving across on the map, so let's see, then in the Zaporizhia direction, enemy shelling was recorded near multiple settlements on the front line. I'll zoom out for these ones here. Although this is quite common, uh, it is still worthy of a mention as Russian shelling targets in these frontline locations such as uh, Stepovoy and Kaminsky in the region just, just happens basically every day at the moment. And this is the short range artillery shelling that's, that's actually not quite really accurate there at all. I've got loads of photos of Russian shelling into empty planes and it's just all, it's all craters basically, mini craters. Then we'll move to the other front line yet again, so Kherson. So some Ukrainian strikes occurred in the Russian-occupied southern region of the Oblast. So we're talking about explosions being reported yet again in Skidovsk. So this is a, a place with a, a military base there, a Russian one, as you can see there, indicated by the tent. Explosions were also reported just about 12 miles due south of Oleshki, which is about 20 kilometers. Uh, here it is, Mali Kapani, so right there as well. And then there was some return Russian artillery shelling at uh, Antonivka. So we haven't really seen much about this one recently, so it's just north of the uh, the bridge there on the, on the, obviously, the recently Ukrainian liberated side in the last couple of months. But what Russia's endgame here is anyone's guess. But they're not coming back over the river that they fleed from about two months ago in early November. That's for certain. So we know that much. So it's pretty much a fact now they don't have that capability anymore to cross it. Which means they'd be looking to hold on to the existing land they have until a ceasefire and acceptance of new territorial realities, as Russia says, uh, occurs. Which... Probably will never. But here's the real kicker. So Ukraine's army has better offensive capabilities now more than ever. And this is probably why Russia has been looking to come to the negotiating table more and more uh, in the recent months and weeks and days. Then in the adjacent Mykolaiv Oblast, so there were powerful explosions reporting in Ochakiv. So here it is just north of the river north of the Kinburn Spit, uh, so this area which is technically part of the Mykolaiv Oblast as well, up until that, uh, that section or that dissection line there. Now there was previously some information about Ukrainian reconnaissance groups on the Kinburn Spit, which uh, was since determined by them that the weather was not permitting larger offensive actions in that area yet. 
Then maybe a little bit of an update on the Black Sea. So what we do know right now is uh, in the Black Sea, there's two enemy ships on combat duty. And there's also two enemy ships uh, on uh, combat duty in the sea, as of, uh, sea of Azov as well right here. Although interestingly, Russia hasn't actually lodged a large missile salvo at Ukraine in about 10 days now. And that last New Year's attack was predominantly found to comprise of the lower yield Iranian made drones, the Shahed 136 drones. And in fact, the absence of Russia's frequent longer range strike capabilities and actions is due to a few factors, not the least of which is from the expected depletion of their missile weapon systems used to perform those strikes. Now this one here, this infographic is an interesting read and I implore you to pause and have a quick read if you like. So Ukrainian intelligence suggests Russia only have enough missiles for two more large scale or waves of attacks which is pretty consistent with what you'll find in this infographic right here. With the exception, of course, being the older and much less accurate S-300 missiles and missile systems. And we know Russia simply cannot produce these things, any of these, fast enough to be impactful in a way that they would otherwise want to be. Not to, me, not to mention Russia or really any country for that matter. They need to maintain at least some decent levels of missile inventories for, say, any further unexpected hypothetical defensive purposes, which any country needs to maintain a decent uh, inventory level of these things. Then we'll move across quickly to some of the news for today. So about 36 hours ago now, so a little bit outside the 24 hour mark I normally talk about, but 50 Ukrainian servicemen were released in a new prisoner swap with Russia which I've got to say is one of the few open lines of negotiation between these two countries. Even then, I believe it's all brokered by neutral third parties or, or third party countries. Then next up in some other news, so really in some sad news, in my opinion, the Russian National Guard, so the Rosgardbarya, was employed to shoot six Russian troops, so six of their own, due to these troops who had signaled their intention to surrender to Ukraine. Now, I do, of course, understand that Russia has upped its mutiny and desertion laws, but I don't know. To me, I just feel like this shows the, the new or increasing levels of insanity that their country has now reached. Then in some other news, Poland and France have put the pressure on Germany to hand over its Leopard tanks to Ukraine. Now, I usually take more of a no-bull approach to my videos, and I don't spend too much time on things that might happen one day. However, this news piece I will make an exception for because it's really starting to appear more and more likely. It Maybe it's not just uh, a matter of if, but a matter of when the Leopard tanks will be introduced into Ukraine. And that's good because these tanks are winter-proofed, Soviet armor busting bay moths right at home in the European winter conditions. And for instance, once the first ones are in the country, the floodgates will open and various other nations will start sending their own as part of a snowball effect. Then in some other news, previously dismiss, uh, dismissed and disgraced Russian General Lapin has now been appointed to his next role of chief of the uh, Russian Grand Forces. So previously Lapin led the center group but had some severe failings on the front lines and then was criticized by Chechnya's Kadyrov and uh, Wagner's Prigozhin, causing Lapin to resign from his previous post. Now, even then, wanted war criminal and former rebel leader Igor Gherkin immediately replied that this is a big mistake and shows the incompetence of the Russian command. So poor leadership is back in the mix again. And of course, there always needs to be a scapegoat for the Russian army and for the guy at the top, for Putin, uh, when he isn't having any or many decisive victories on the battlefield. But it just so turns out that this future second time scapegoat is particularly ineffective with his military management. 
Next up in some news, so Russia's price of oil, so the Urals oil, is selling at 37 or 38 US dollars per barrel, which is more than half, or less than half, I should say, the world price of Brent oil, which is sitting at about $78. And well below the ceiling cap of $60 introduced by the G7 nations. Now, typically Russian oil is always 10 or 20 US dollars a barrel cheaper than uh, that of other oil exporters because it's just lower quality, plain and simple. But the gap is widening now and roughly half the price. So with Russia having a well, such a tiny pool of, of market participants or willing buyers now, the demand and therefore the price goes down, down, down. Which there in turn means it's a price that certainly makes it more difficult for Russia to fund its war machine. For a country whose export economy is predominantly reliant on hydrocarbons like this, like oil. And I suspect the price is likely to stay quite disproportionately lower than other international oil exporter costs because without getting into too much of the details right now, so although Russia has plenty to extract from the ground, they don't have the international shipping network for it because something like 96% or so of uh, oil exports are via an international shipping conglomerate or network that won't allow insurance on the shipments of this Russian oil if it's uh, above a certain price, the $60 cap for instance. But then there's also a whole plethora of other built-in uncertainties around purchasing the oil. So the cheaper price per barrel doesn't automatically make buyers come running for this risky and rather low quality version of the commodity. Then moving to a little bit of a lighter news, so uh, although Bakhmut is tough, the defenders are keeping pretty chipper, as we would say down under, or, or pretty upbeat. Uh, like this Georgian Legion soldier in Bakhmut fighting for Ukraine. And you know what? I'm yet to see any footage of high morale uh, on the, the Russian soldiers, the soldiers on the opposite, opposite sides of the front lines. I mean, I come across a lot of videos, as you might expect, and it's quite the opposite, in fact, what I find. They're mostly always just complaining. Uh, those Russian soldiers. Which brings me to Russian mobilization blunders for today. I've got a few too many. I'm starting to get a backlog. In fact, these are all quite fresh, these ones. They're not even a backlog. Um, and there's honestly too, ma uh, too many. So I'll do a quick power session with these ones. So in this first one, uh, we've found that Russian soldiers are receiving aluminum armor, armor with medieval scale designs included. Looks like a bullet went right through this one but you know this is the state of the russian army in 2023 then next up uh, next blunder so tents housing for the mobilized have been set on fire at a military base in orenburg so this is in central russia where they're staged just before they come to the front lines and this has been happening quite a bit now and appears to delay deployment of the russian infantry to the front lines somebody doesn't want to go then in yet another blunder, so mobilized Mobix from the Ikursk uh, region in also a bit more central Russia there are being taken in a cattle truck, but they still go. And the soldiers are showing the conditions in which they have to travel. Ice inside wooden wagons, dirty, and instead of a toilet, a hole is being cut in the floor. <laughs> Was that for the cattle? No light, no heating, literally like a cow to the abattoir. Then yet another quick one. So Russia keeps saying there's no new round of mobilization yet, uh, officially, and yet we keep getting more footage of fresh waves of mobilize, uh, mobilization orders sent to Russians. And I know what you must be wondering, they have toilets? Well, in the major cities they do, which to me is more of a confirmation that they're needing to mobilize their urban citizens in greater numbers now. So perhaps the frequency or regularity of Russian mobilization blunders somewhat coincides perhaps with uh, ultimately with Russia's military and political demise. Then in a bit of a quick funny uh, to round it off with, so Russia's only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, is in a state of emergency and about to sink. So 35 ship repair plants in Russia that are assigned to this floating disaster 
are all trying to shift the responsibility to one another. Surprise, surprise. But, you know, of course this thing is in ill repair or disrepair. In fact, there was a fire on board the Kuznetsov, uh, so this one just three weeks ago, and it had several fires and emergencies on it before. Plus, this 50,000 steel ton monstrosity of useless steel has a tow boat permanently with it, so permanently assigned to it. And the funny thing is that's not even a recent development because since about 2015, it's always had a tow boat next to it. Uh, that's that's just embarrassing. Just type in uh, the name of, of this ship in Google and it's always being towed. You'll see there. So it's really no wonder there are 35 ship repair contractors assigned to this thing. I wonder what Putin's first clue was that this wasn't getting fixed, this thing. Was it the 34th repair contractor or the 35th? Now, unfortunately, uh, Russia will probably never accept the real reason as to why things like this are always happening to its military hardware being in such a state of disrepair because all of the oligarchs that have repair contracts instead misappropriated the funds and the vast majority of those funds uh, went to things like buying themselves yachts or um, instead a, a few even went to super yachts. So in a word, corruption. And this is really the systemic underlying failings of Russia's autocratic system of governance that cannot ever be fixed or repaired, at least as long as the existing political structures are in place. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, thanks for all your comments, uh, your likes and your support. I really appreciate it all. I can't tell you how much I do. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers again.